Okay, the mic's working. Yeah, sounds like it. Welcome uh, to the, I think, last but one session uh, of the OpenStack Summit. The fact that you're here means you're really committed to learning about Delta Cloud. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is David Ludacard. I'm an engineer in Red Hat's uh, cloud engineering group. Um, and I also maintain Apache Delta Cloud, which is what I'm going to be talking about here. Um, I also participate in the working group that does the CME standard, um, and I'll talk a bit more about that too. Kind of the, the overarching thing I want to get input on, on and, and some thoughts on is how we can foster more collaboration between OpenStack and Delta Cloud, and you know, whether there's interest from the OpenStack side to, to um, go deeper into, into uh, interconnecting the two. So the, my talk, I'll talk about cloud APIs in general, just what's, you know, what the general landscape is a little bit. Um, then I'll talk about what Apache Delta Cloud does and what it's for and you know, what it's solving. I'll explain what CME is. Um, I'll say a few words about the EC2 front end we have. I don't think I need to say very much about EC2 since I assume that pretty much everybody is familiar with what it is and how it works, at least at a high level. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how to use Delta Cloud with OpenStack. So cloud APIs. It's, um, as one of my colleagues likes to say, it's a total goat rodeo out there. Cloud APIs are the way that you know, every vendor tries to lock their users into their specific solution. Um, because if you use anybody's cloud, um, sooner or later you'll have so many tools, so many assumptions in your usage of that cloud that moving from one cloud to another is, is very difficult. Um, and uh, even if lock-in wasn't a big problem, just the, the differences between the APIs are, in a lot of cases, big enough that you, know, you have to do, do a lot of gymnastics to, to adapt whatever, you, you know, whatever management or tooling you do against the cloud from one cloud to another. And these cloud APIs, I mean, some of them have material differences. There's you know, differences in features. You know, one cloud lets you build private networks and you know, VPNs and whatnot, and others don't. But then there's also a lot of what I like to call annoying innovation, where the same thing is done in slightly different ways, which is just a headache to, to code against. Um, and yeah, those, those two buckets we, we try to kind of make you forget with Delta Cloud. Um, and you know, the situation kind of screams for a standard, for something that you know, everybody agrees on they can use. Um, there's, kind of two, uh, there's two kind of standards. Um, I think for, from an OpenStack point of view, everybody's very, very uh, comfortable with uh, the idea of a de facto standard. I mean, OpenStack is clearly trying to establish itself as, as a de facto standard. Um, and I would view it as, as one of the two likely candidates of a uh, de facto standard in the industry. The other one, of course, is EC2. Uh, even though coming here to the summit, like every time it doubles in size and it's gigantically big, and I'm always floored by how much interest there is around OpenStack, it's easy to forget that the cloud world is much bigger than OpenStack, and there's a lot of things going on, a lot of players that aren't OpenStack. Um, EC2 has all kinds of problems, even as a de facto standard, uh, from a technical point of view, from you know, all kinds of other things. Um, there is, though, also demand, de facto standards, and me as an open source guy, that's like what I feel really comfortable with, right? the de facto standard. We have an implementation, everybody writes to its API, and that's great, everybody's going to be happy. But there are situations where a de facto standard isn't good enough. For example, if government entities want to put certain solutions in you know, RFPs, they can't just say, oh, make it look like OpenStack or some other implementation. They have to actually cite something that is a recognized standard that NIST or ISO or somebody has actually given their, their stamp of approval to. And in the, in the CME working group, we actually have a bunch of telecoms, and they are very, very keen on having a standard for exactly that reason, so that they can go to vendors and say, build me something that uh, works with this spec here. There's an open source community. The, the challenges, or generally the, the challenges around standards are that you know, for it to be accepted, you really need both. You need a de facto standard that's also de jure standard, a standard that, that isn't a de facto standard. It just sits on the shelf and annoys the hell out of people. Um, 
And yeah, we know from the open source experience there's really only one good way to build software, and that's the open source way. Um, yeah, we know that these tight, that the tight cycles and the feedback from users into implementations, all that has all kinds of good benefits for, for the software that comes out of it. Um, but open source is not enough um, because there are proprietary players who will never jump on open source solutions. Um, especially in the cloud space, I'm sure everybody can think of at least one of the players that uh, will be very hesitant to jump in. Um, and for a standard to, to be really good, more from a technical point of view, it has to be adaptable. Uh, it ha you have to be able to offer that API, for example, in front of lots of variations of the same cloud. Right? Kind of like uh, when you deploy OpenStack, you deploy Cinder, do you deploy Quantum with it? If you don't, users of, the, of your installation should be able to find out what's there and what they can rely on. So that's kind of the big picture um, around this whole API discussion. Um, for Delta Cloud, uh, we started Delta Cloud a long, long time ago, uh, at the, towards the end of 2009. The reason we started is we, we looked at what was happening in the cloud landscape at that point, and we saw that you know, there was a gigantic potential um, for, for lock-in, and we didn't want you know, our users and for the whole, for the whole industry, really, to, to, for this lock-in to happen. So if you, if you notice, this predates OpenStack, actually, um, Delta Cloud. So there was no OpenStack when we started it. Um, and uh, in talking to people around Delta Cloud, partners, customers, whatever users, um, it became clear that they looked, you know, since Delta Cloud was a Red Hat project, they looked at it as not so different from you know, APIs that any vendor will, will offer. They're like, it's just a you know, variation of the same problem. And to address that, we took uh, Delta Cloud in 2010, I think, we took it to the Apache Incubator. Um, and made an Apache project just you know, so it's clear it's not a Red Hat thing. You know, it's not Red Hat owned. Um, Apache has all these processes around you know, who owns what and how you get involved and who gets a say and, and all those things. So by, by going to the Apache Software Foundation, um, we cleared all that up and we've been a top level project at Apache since uh, October 2011. So like a year and a half now. Okay, architecturally... Uh -huh. It took, it took a while. I mean, it took like a year or so, I think. Um, I think at the time, the incubator was just very slow moving. And uh, yeah, there, there weren't any, because we were an open source project before, so yeah, a lot of the things that the incubator is supposed to do, like teach you how to do, yeah, how to work as an open source community, we already knew. Um, there was, the, the one really useful thing about the incubator was the Apache Software Foundation is super anal about anything to do with IP. Um, yeah, to make sure that you know, all your I's are, cross, uh, I's are dotted and T's are crossed about you know, copyright and licensing and where code came from. I mean, that really made a difference in just cleanliness of you know, documenting. You know, because we had a few, few places where we just copied and pasted some code in you know, documenting where that came from. Um, so, yeah. And, and I think today they, they, they've, um, the ASF has cleaned up the whole incubation process, and I think it's much, much faster now for, process, uh, for projects to move there, through there than, uh, than at the time we did it. Yeah, and I mean, we, took, we also took uh, that part of the reason why we're in incubation so long is we also took it as an opportunity to kind of experiment with our APIs and you know, break compatibility and took... Uh, graduating is the point where it's said, you know, this is stable now. Um, we're not going to break uh, APIs in a backwards and incompatible way anymore. I mean, the breakage was very minor, but there was still some in, in the course. So when we started, we just had what I now call the classic Delta Cloud uh, API. Um, yeah, this is like a architecture diagram, you could say, of, of Delta Cloud. So Delta Cloud is a, is a RESTful API. It's different in that uh, if from the, from you know, the, the various cross-cloud libraries you might know, like JClouds, Fog, Bodo, whatnot. Um, so when you run Delta Cloud, you run a server and it exposes uh, one or more RESTful or, or uh, web APIs, let's call it that. So we have three front ends that you know, are kind of responsible for taking in requests and turning them into internal objects. And there's a little bit of core functionality. And then for each of the clouds we talk to, um, we have a driver. So we have an EC2 driver and an OpenStack driver and uh, an overt driver and what have you. 
Um, when we started Delta Cloud, we only had the classic, what I now call the classic Delta Cloud API, which we uh, were building in kind of the bottom-up open source manner. We started with like the simplest possible thing that could work, you know, just enough to let you launch instances and stop them. And then over time, we added a lot more functionality to have uh, pretty complete coverage of uh, what an IAS API does. And then we got, yeah, we were doing that for about a year, and then Red Hat got involved with uh, the DMTF, the Distributed Management Task Force, who was working on the standard CME. I'll talk in, about more in detail what that is in a minute. Um, and so we added a second uh, front end, the, the CME front end, kind of as, as a, for us a proof of concept and get a feel for what this standard really does and you know, where, where it works well and where it doesn't. Um, and then the third one happened really last year at the OpenStack Summit. There was you know, a project that was writing um, an, EC, an alternative EC2 front end for OpenStack called Awesome, I think. And we looked at that and we're like, you could do this much, much you know, more easily with Delta Cloud because all the plumbing's in place already. It's really just about how you expose the internal plumbing in the API to make it an EC2 compatible front end. And so we, we added that. Um, and for example, our Overt or RevM, which is Red Hat's vert management uh, solution, um, now uses Delta Cloud to, um, to give people a kind of a lightweight cloud. Like, you know, you run Delta Cloud in front of RevM and you can talk to it as if it were a cloud and use one of these three APIs, including EC2. So the drivers is really what you know, makes, makes Delta Cloud useful and here's kind of a list or a picture of most of them, um, the ones, you know, the clouds we support in the back end. Uh, of course, OpenStack's there. Um, yeah, Fujitsu has been, Fujitsu has their own cloud and they've actually been very, very active in making sure that their cloud is, is supported. Um, as I said, you can use Delta Cloud also to turn word management software into a cloud as a cloud front end. And we do that for vSphere and for Overt for this RevM thing. And IBM um, yeah, has also been active in, in helping us out implementing that. So that's kind of the high level overview of, of Delta Cloud. No, that's, I think we've got time. Yeah. yeah. So, so what we do is in, uh, in the classic Delta Cloud interface, we actually advertise in the entry point when you first come to the server, we advertise variations. Like you know, some clouds don't let you inject user data into instances when you launch them. So you know, we tell you whether that's there or not. So when you go to launch an instance, you know what to do or you can, you know, the client can throw up their hands in the air and say, hey, I really need these particular features. Yeah. 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 I mean, we, we don't have we don't have any queuing functionality in in Delta Cloud yet. Like, yeah. But I mean, if you, for example, if you, as I said in the beginning, if you deploy OpenStack without Cinder, right? You, you know, without a volume block storage, um, you'll just not see certain things in the API that you know, talk about block storage. Or if you don't have a Swift, you know, we have functionality for the blob bucket storage type stuff. If you don't have Swift, they won't show up and you can't really get to them. Okay, CME. Um, it's done, as I said, by the Distributed Management Task Force. Um, the thing that you know, makes this very different from kind of OpenStack is that it's, you know, it's very industry heavy, very vendor heavy but it has you know, very broad participation across anybody who's got an interest in cloud, like you know, Oracle's there and VMware's there and Microsoft and IBM and you name them. Um, if you don't know the DMTF, they're also famous for things like OVF, this format of encapsulating virtual machines um, and moving them around, and something called SIM, which is like a very low level standard, which uh, is the backbone for, I think, stuff, stuff like Dash and Smash and SM BIOS, these are all DMTF things. Um, and yeah, you know, when we worked on the standard, we kind of started looking at what's out there. What have, do people have in in terms of APIs, and you know, try to come up with enough functionality to cover most of what people do. 
took a pretty long time, took almost two years to, to uh, from the first meetings to, to actually publish the standard. It, version 1.0 was published last summer in August. Um, it is a RESTful API and it's completely from the ground up. If you've seen SIM before, uh, CIMI has 75% uh, has of the name uh, the same as, as CIMI, but uh, nothing else. Like it's, you know, it's completely disconnected from that. Um, one of the things we were very careful in the classic Delta Cloud API was to really just make it a translation layer so that we wouldn't have to keep state. With CME, that's, not po uh, that's possible, and you have to run a database when you run data at Delta Cloud with a CME front, and there's certain things in the standard that just force us to keep, you know, to keep some data. Yeah, <clears throat> it's not great, but um, it's also not a big deal. Okay, so the model um, for CME is really, if you've seen a RESTful API, there's very few surprises there. Um, the only thing you need to know to go to the, the, the server, which in this case would be a Delta Cloud server running, is you know, the URL of the entry point, and from there you can get to everything else. Um, there's, you know, there's several buckets of functionality, which are underneath here, systems, machines, volumes, networks. There's another big bucket around events, monitoring, and all that. Um, but you know, in, in terms of implementation, what Delta Cloud does, we have you know, very good coverage on kind of the machines, servers in, in OpenStack speak, very good coverage on the block storage side. We're working on the networking side. Um, CME has a very rich networking model, which is, looks surprisingly familiar to anybody who knows quantum, because they were actually done by the same people, really. Um, but yeah, we're working on that, um, you know, getting networking in there. And then the, the last thing is uh, systems, which is a way to manage a whole bunch of resources as, as one thing. So you can say, I want these networks uh, and these instances based off these images and these volumes and bundle it all up and control it as one unit. Um, yeah, and yeah, so CME, because we approach it from the point of view of it has to be, you know, for, the, for the provider, it has to be very flexible what they support and what they don't support. Pretty much anything in CME is optional. If you look at the standard, uh, don't be discouraged. It's, it's a pretty big document, like 200 pages. Um, but it's enough. If, most of it is more like a reference. Uh, so if you read the first 10 pages, you're pretty much good to go. And then you can look up the things you're interested in. There's also primer. If you want to read about it, I would start with a primer. Um, yeah, and it's, it's very regular. There's, yeah, for discoverability, there's this notion of metadata. Yeah, so you can indicate whether you know, when you create a machine, you can inject user data or whether machines, when they first come up, whether they're stopped or started, um, those things are all discoverable so that you know, clients can adapt to those variations. Just as a, I mean, as a little, I know API demos are really exciting, but just to give you a bit better feel, this is... Um, <laughs> um, yeah, this is an excerpt of what you get when you go to that cloud entry point. Um, it, uh, the more important things are kind of at the bottom. It gives you pointers to where the machines are and volumes and all that. And then when you go to that URL, it will actually tell you what URL to go to to create a machine, for example, and lists all the machines with pointers to uh, details about each machine. So it's uh, using the standard RESTful HADOS pattern. There's a little bit of uh, metadata there, like um, yeah, the, the driver and provider, that's really a Delta Cloud thing because you can use the same Delta Cloud server to talk to many different clouds. You just send, uh, send a couple headers. You send a header that says which driver you want. I want the EC2 driver for this request. I want the vSphere driver for this request. And then there's a concept called a provider, which is really the URL of the endpoint. Then if you say, I want to talk to vSphere in your driver header, you also have to supply the URL where the vSphere is running. Or if you say OpenStack, you have to provide the URL of the keystone for that open stack. Um, that, and then here's just, you know, even though the standard is, is uh, pretty big, um, actually doing something with it is, is yeah, pretty straightforward. So this is you know, the simplest way how you can create a machine. You just post a bunch of uh, JSON to the server, and the individual things is a machine config is what OpenStack calls a flavor. It says, you know, I want this much RAM, this many CPUs. Machine image is the image that you want to boot the server off. And then you can also specify credentials, which in CME are their own object. Um, and you know, uh, the, the SSH keys get put in 
that go with these credentials get put into the, the machine somehow. And what you get back underneath the line is the response, which is just the location of the URL for the new machine you just created. And then you can go there and see what state it's in and when it's done. I mean, it's no surprise, I think, for anybody who's ever seen the Nova API. Um, what we Delta Cloud specifically are doing around CME is uh, a number of things. There's you know, the CME front end, which lets you use C, uh, Delta Cloud as a CME provider server. Um, we have for the classic Delta Cloud API, we had the API would respond to JSON and XML, but we also had an HTML. You know, it would also do HTML requests, which was really nice for people to kind of explore the API and just click around because it's a little nicer than staring at XML or JSON. Um, for CME, because the standard says you know, it's only JSON and XML, we actually moved that into a separate little app, a web app that you know, talks to a CME server and then just shows you, you know, your machines and whatever, whatnot in a slightly nicer way. The, the whole point of this web app is, is more as something to help you explore the API. It's not meant as like a full application that does much more than, than the API itself. Yeah, that, that web app is, is actually yeah, a normal web app. It has forms and, yeah, 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 and buttons that you click on. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's also a little test suite that you can use to, yeah, if somebody claims it's a, yeah, that they have a CME endpoint, you can run, use the test suite to at least um, reassure yourself that that's really, yeah, that really has kind of the functionality that a CME thing should have. Um, and one of the things we're, we're working on is um, the server itself actually has in it a big part of what you would want for, for a Ruby client. Um, and you know, we did some work on uh, make it, to make it possible to pull that out. There's a little more work needed, but um, then we'll also give you a Ruby client that you can use to talk to any CME server, be it Delta Cloud or anything else. Okay, that was it for what I wanted to say about CME specifically. Um, the EC2 front end, as I said, it started as a proof of con kind of a proof of concept on the Lark, um, just to see how how easy it is to put another API in front of Delta Cloud. Um, RevM uses it now as uh, their EC2 front end. It's the functionality is still kind of basic. It you know, it kind of gives you enough to do lifecycle management and launch instances. Uh, you can manage SSH keys. There's you know, a lot more things that could and should be done. A lot of things that would actually be supported by you know, the Delta Cloud Core and the drivers that we haven't really exposed in, in that easy tool front end. Um, but yeah, it's there. And if you know, there's interest, we can easily expand it. I was amazed by how quickly that easy tool front end came together. It was like a week or so. Um, so it's, it's really easy to expose what's there already um, with a query API. Okay, so what specifically for OpenStack, what does Delta Cloud support? What kind of things can it do? Um, so for Nova, we're, you know, we have pretty complete coverage of kind of the Nova functionality. You can you know, talk about flavors and regions and images, um, servers. Um, Swift is pretty much all there too. We have, uh, we have block, storage, um, block bucket type. Um, storage, object storage um, in the classic Delta Cloud API and use Swift for that. Um, Cinder is, yeah, is there, Glance. So yeah, those things we have, the, big, yeah, the biggest hole obviously is Quantum that we're working on, uh, as I said. Um, but yeah, you can do a lot with, with Delta Cloud against, running against OpenStack. Um, in terms of how to use it, um, it's, uh, it's a little web server that you bring up um, just because uh, normally a client would, the client would talk to, to some OpenStack installation and now you're putting Delta Cloud in the middle just in terms of network topology. You want the Delta Cloud server either to run close to the client if you're you know, running an application or close to the API and the native API endpoint. And I mean, if you're deploying OpenStack, that's what I would do is you know, run it together with your API endpoints for you know, Nova and Keystone and whatnot, um, just to avoid uh, additional uh, network overhead. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's yeah, running it is, is very unevent uneventful. You install it, you tell it where um, Keystone is, and that's pretty much it. Um, oh, as I said, the server is stateless, which also means we don't store any credentials. Um, we don't do any account multiplexing or anything. What you do is when you make requests, we use basic 
uh, HTTP authentication, and so you send as your user, you, know, you send us basically username, password, um, where the username also has to contain your, your tenant or project for OpenStack. Um, but you just do that with every request, and there's no worries about you know, somebody breaking into Delta Cloud and stealing credentials, other than so sniffing. No. Um, actually, the Keystone token, I think we do yeah, for a while. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, OpenStack, you first you have this two-step thing, right, where you first have to go to Keystone, and so yeah, yeah, for that, I think we do that. There's, I mean, if you run the CME front and you have to have a database uh, for, sorry. Well, if you if you only run like the classic Delta Cloud front, then no, there's no no database when you talk to OpenStack or EC2. Okay, if you want to learn more about Delta Cloud, this is uh, where the project pages are, where you can find docs and how to install it and where to get the code and all that good stuff. And we also hang out on Pound Delta Cloud and Freenode if you have questions, um, need to find uh, help. Okay. Um, I mean, since, since we worried about that recently, like the networking models are a little differently different. Like you know, quantum has the notion of a port, which kind of lives on its own, whereas uh, EC2 has network interfaces, which have to, uh, have to be attached to a machine. Um, those, those are kind of yeah, model differences. Between, I mean, and it, it's mostly like small details. Um, it's either big functionality that's missing or like small details like this port versus NIC kind of thing. Um, in terms of, are you specifically asking like where OpenStack still has to catch up with EC2? Yeah, yeah I, I think there the, the biggest one isn't so much in the, the biggest difference isn't so much in like the core services, you know, storage, compute and all that. The biggest difference is in all the stuff that EC2 off, uh, offers uh, beyond that, like you know, queuing, whatever, mail, hosted databases, all those things which are another point of where you lock yourself into a cloud, right? And it uh, would be for OpenStack just by itself really interesting to, to work on some of, the, of the, these services. I mean, there's some talk about the more network-oriented services like load balancers, uh, VPNs, and all that. Um, but I don't know if there's much work around queuing and, and those things. Yes? I was so uh, waiting whether anybody would ask that question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think it would be a huge, huge issue to put an OpenStack front and so you can talk OpenStack to EC2. Yeah, oh yeah, I should have mentioned that yeah, Heat is, what heat, the Heat guys are actually using Delta Cloud to have Heat talk to different clouds. So what they're doing is they have, you know, kind of in their back end, they have, yeah, they started with code that just talks to the OpenStack API, and they're implementing a second kind of backend that talks Delta Cloud so that you can run heat against you know, vSphere, for example, or you know, some of the smaller clouds that are head up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's Ruby written in Ruby, and we use a little framework called Sinatra. Okay. Yes? It's, I mean, we have patches for it that are, I think, pretty much ready to, to be committed, so that you have at least the, the beginnings of quantum, quantum functionality, like uh, live uh, network, uh, so you can create networks and delete them. You can attach, yeah, you can create ports, attach them to machines, and all that. Um, and that's uh, a, a matter of a little code review, I think. Uh, if if they haven't, I haven't really looked at the code this week, but um, it's imminent. Any more quick questions? Yeah. Uh huh. You want to talk to this man there? <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, well, thanks for your interest and um, enjoy the rest of the summit, the, another hour or so. Thank you.